Well, welcome everybody. The uh, Conservation Commission is very happy to host Kate Kelly of the Lewis Creek Association and Hinesburg Conservation Commission. Yes. yes. Uh, Just with my LCA hat on tonight. On an LCA hat tonight. I thought it was in there. Of course. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me and thanks for coming out on a beautiful evening. I think if it were me, I would not have come here tonight. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I work for Lewis Creek Association and we have a group of uh, water quality monitors who are all volunteers, some of whom are in this room. Um, and I just want to talk to you tonight a little bit about some of the things we've learned and how we can kind of take an um, approach together to help protect both like Champlain and sort of our, our waterways here in Moncton as well. Um, and, you know, really we invite you to join with Lewis Creek Association, um, whether that's volunteering or um, donating time or money. Um, we do have a sign up sheet here. I send out like a monthly newsletter if you're interested in getting on that um, on that newsletter. It's just an email thing and you can get on or off anytime you please, but um, drop me your email if you're not on there already and I'm happy to add you. Um, okay, so we know that Lake Champlain is a really important and valued resource for Vermonters. Uh, in 2017, the Clean Water Report by the Vermont State Treasurer said that about 300 million is raised each year in tax revenues um, just from tourism here in Vermont each year. Um, and that number from tourism is really only a portion or about a fifth of what we bring in in revenue because of all our beautiful you know, natural resources and our clean lake. A uh, polluted Lake Champlain is costly to all taxpayers. Uh, really may be costly for generations to come. So recently we've been losing money due to um, decreased property values along the lake, tourism sort of dropping off as well as lake cleanup expenses by failing to slow down the rate of phosphorus going into Lake Champlain. So we have too much of this nutrient called phosphorus. Um, according to that same report, the 20 year cleanup costs were projected to be about $2.3 billion. Um, so $115 million per year to clean up Lake Champlain. So we really have to work at every level from property owners to our towns, to the state level, to really restore the health and functioning of our watersheds. Um, we're gonna really need everyone to pitch in, whether it's you, know, you guys here in Moncton, us in Hinesburg, or the lakeshore owners down in Lake Champlain to help um, restore that health and beauty of our of our lake. Okay, so phosphorus, what is the deal? Um, how does it get into the lake? You know, what's the problem with it? Well, phosphorus is a nutrient. Um, if you have a garden and you put fertilizer on your garden, you're probably putting one of three nutrients in there. One of those is phosphorus or P. Um, there's also nitrogen and potassium, so N and K. Um, here in the Lake Champlain Valley, we have some clay soils that have these really fine sort of clay particles, and those have bound to phosphorus over time. So there's phosphorus sort of embedded in like with the soil particles. So during our rain events, you see our streams get all muddy, right? And those that mud, that sediment is washing down into Lake Champlain, as you can see in this river, mm -hmm. and it's car carrying not just the soil, but also um, fertilizer, phosphorus, manure, you know, these tiny particles, they get washed out really far into the lake because they're so tiny. They don't just like drop to the bottom. They get washed out into Lake Champlain. Um, just a tiny amount of erosion uh, of bare soils can cause erosion um, because of these real fine particles. And phosphorus then provides the bulk of food for algae. So for plants that are, you know, that could grow in our lakes or our rivers. Uh, when algae has too much growth, like excess growth, um, it can include the toxic blue-green algae, also known as cyanobacteria. I should probably say that the other way around. The proper name is cyanobacteria. Blue-green algae is sort of the like more common vernacular name for it. Um, and when those things happen, they can lead to fish kills due to oxygen um, problems. In when the algae die, the bacteria that decompose the algae consume oxygen in the water. And so then there's not enough oxygen for things like fish. And so we end up with fish kills in the lake. 
Um, I don't remember, honestly. Um, that was courtesy of the basin program. I'll have to look back and see where it was. Um, so I just wanted to show you briefly sort of an idea that this, this slide really helped me when I was learning about um, water and like runoff and what happens with water when it falls on different types of, of um, you know, surfaces. So over on the left side, you have more of a naturally forested surface. Um, you've got trees, grass. Um, so when rain falls on that type of surface, you get about 50% of it sinking down or infiltrating into the ground. So 25% goes sort of in the shallow area and 25% goes deep into the ground. 10% uh, of it might run off the surface of, of the forest or the grassy area. And then 40% of it evaporates back up into the sky, whether that's through the trees or, or otherwise. But then on the right side, you've got sort of a built city environment or town environment. Um, you can see, so when rain falls there, you get 55% of it, so more than half of it runs off the surface because you have pavement and buildings and whatnot. There's nowhere for it to go. Um, you only get about 15% that's infiltrating into the ground and then about 30% that's evaporating into the air. So when that happens, you end up with a lot more water just moving on the surface of the ground, right? 50% of it is ending up somewhere, whether in a stream or, um, you know, your, I don't know, basement or whatever, <laughs> but it's not going, it's not sinking down into the ground the way it would have naturally. Okay, so the phosphorus in Lake Champlain, um, I'm going to show you these two sort of graphs to try to explain where the phosphorus comes from, according to some, essentially some modeling efforts. Um, on the left side is the Vermont portion of the Lake Champlain Basin and where the amount of phosphorus comes from. So overall, we contribute 631 metric tons per year of phosphorus. Um, again, I wish I had a good image to throw in your brains about what a metric ton of phosphorus looks like, but I don't. <laughs> so you have to imagine that. Um, the majority of that 41% comes from agricultural lands, um, followed by stream channel erosion and developed lands, towns and cities and whatnot. Um, substantial bit also comes from our forest lands and then just a little bit from wastewater treatment plants. Uh, and then on the right side of the screen, you're looking at what our, what the target is for like cleaning up Lake Champlain. So this is how much we have to reduce our phosphorus by. Um, so essentially our, our target is to get down to 417 metric tons per year from that 631. Um, and we need to reduce phosphorus by, you know, about 30% with the largest and most cost-effective reductions coming from agricultural lands. So from 41 down to 28%. Um, yeah, please. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Where in, where does the phosphorus come from that goes into the forest lands? Yeah, good consider? question. Yeah, so, um, so the idea is like old logging roads and that kind of thing often are, you know, they weren't built with water quality in mind. So they might have like a stream crossing, uh, with you know, a steep logging road coming down to a stream crossing. When you get that erosion, you've got, you know, sediment coming right down the road and washing straight into a stream. So that's one, you know, one source or one example, I guess. Um, and they're essentially that number, that like high forest number is really because we have so much forest land. So it's not that like per acre of forest land that there's a ton of phosphorus coming off of it, but we just have a lot of forested land. So that percentage is, is pretty high. A lot, it's a lot of it's naturally occurring. I, I don't know if people that fertilize the forest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there could be some legacy, like old phosphorus from before it was forest land and it yes. was agriculture and it was getting fertilized or whatever. But now it's probably just from sediment or, or poor, like sort of poor forestry practices, you know, with folks crossing streams and, and that type of thing or not closing out their forest roads properly. Okay, so one of the things that uh, contributes to erosion and flooding today is some practices that we did in the past uh, where we tried to straighten rivers and armor the banks of rivers to uh, you know, save our farm fields or our backyards. Um, so on the left side of the screen where that little yellow arrow is pointing, it's really hard to see, but there's 
sort of a naturally curvy or sinuous river. Um, that's the La Platte River in Hinesburg um, near Shelburne Falls and O'Neill Road. Uh, so that river naturally is doing this, you know, <laughs> and there's lots of old oxbows and, and it moves naturally. Um, on the right side of the screen is just a little bit further upstream in Hinesburg Village. So this is Route 116, where it makes the big curve by the school uh, and Silver Street coming in from the south. And that river that you cross there is also the La Platte River, but it's almost perfectly straight. So back in the 60s, that was straightened. It was dug out. A new channel was dug. And um, unfortunately, as you can imagine, you know, a river that's going like this is meandering. It's going nice and slow. But when you straighten it, that same amount of water is now shooting and going faster. And so it ends up kind of down cutting and taking the banks and the sediment with it. Um, so of the reaches that have been assessed in the La Platte watershed, which is not where we are now, but um, that was 66 miles, about 21% of those were showing us straightened. And I think the percentage is a little bit less here in Lewis Creek watershed, like maybe like 14% straightened, but it's still um, still an issue today. It's kind of hard for a river to recover from, from that, at least in any quick time frame. Um, as we saw last year, uh, we're getting these more frequent flooding events, more rainfall, more rain in the winter, um, bigger, heavier storms. And all those things are really increasing the rate of phosphorus, you know, reaching Lake Champlain. Uh, those water soluble phosphorus fertilizers and rich you know, phosphorus rich soils are washing off our, you know, lawns, our farm fields, whatever, into our surface waters. And we have this very large land drainage area in Lake Champlain Basin. So we have a lot of land draining to this smallish lake and taking a lot of this phosphorus with it. So since our river systems are really connected to our lake health, we have to really work together to improve both Lake Champlain and our and our river water quality. It really takes this sort of all in approach to um, to manage, you know, our pollution problems in the lake. All right, so hopefully we're going to be able to watch a brief video. Um, it's going to talk about three river management principles, so the way that we, we manage rivers. Um, the new strategy is shown first, followed by the historic stream alteration or change that, are, that it um, replaces, and then talks a little bit about why the replacement is important.
interestingly, that video came out of Europe, but it has the same, you know, it still works here in, uh, in Vermont. Now I gotta figure out how to make the video stop and go on to the next week. Oh no. Hmm, now I've done it. Hmm. Okay. Well, we got somewhere, just not where I wanted to be. Hang on just a minute. <laughs> okay, there we are. Okay, so um, so just to sort of reiterate the, the three principles that we looked at, um, we have to allow those natural floodplains to work by slowing the flows of the river and allowing those sediments to kind of drop out of, of the river. When that happens, the the soil that you know soil with a lot of clay in it and um, and that phosphorus embedded in the soil can sort of settle out onto the floodplains and deliver the nutrients to the plants in those floodplains as opposed to carrying it down to the lake. Um, those fully functioning river corridors and floodplains allow that stream water to kind of stay more local as opposed to um, you know and maybe even recharge the groundwater before it just heads downstream. So slowing the flow down, um, when our streams can meander naturally and make that movement, it really slows the, the speed of the river down and that makes those flows less erosive and both habitat and water quality increase naturally. So with that increased stream length, the meanders and gentle river flows can um, provide you know, habitat features for our fish and our turtles and everything that lives in our streams, um, as well as other animals that live on land. Uh, removing those um, gravel sediments from the stream bed can cause down cutting where the river sort of cuts, you know, deeper and deeper. It adds to the stream speed and the force and therefore that erosion and sediment loading into Lake Champlain. So overall, the message is just that what we need, what we do in one place really affects what goes on in other places in the watershed. Um, so we really need to look at things as a, an entire watershed, not just as a, a local area. Okay, so here in Vermont, um, the state has recently, I'd say recently in the last like few years, um, put in new regulations into place that includes the three acre permit where we're looking at areas that have three acres or more of impervious surface, like our schools, for example, in many cases, um, they have to now treat that uh, about 50% of the stormwater has to be cleaned up before it leaves their property. Um, the municipal roads general permits or towns are now responsible for uh, maintaining their roads properly if they drain into a stream or a water body and required agricultural practices. So our towns and our property owners have to meet these requirements often at you know, their own and great expense. There are also voluntary conservation measures. Um, this is a, a conservation easement along Lewis Creek in Starksboro. Um, it will allow the stream to meander naturally and to access its floodplain, as was shown in the video. Um, so LCA and, and local land trusts often work together to, you know, bring these um, bring these voluntary measures um, forward and and allow those types of projects to um, to improve water quality over time. So we do this type of sampling where we're monitoring water quality and it helps us detect hotspots while also understanding trends and what's going on with our with our rivers. So we have a volunteer water quality monitoring program uh, that helps inform where we do projects in towns. We don't have very many here in Moncton, but maybe we'll increase that one of these days, as well as the work of our state agencies that we partner with. Um, they provide the funding for the actual sample analysis. We just provide the volunteers who go out on the ground and, and the coordination to, to make those samples happen. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief summary of what we know about sort of water quality in Moncton based on what we've done in the last like year or so. Um, so we currently monitor streams in both the La Platte watershed, which is at the north end of this map, um, and the Lewis Creek watershed, which is the major portion of the map, and then the Thorpe Brook and other direct to lake drainages that are on the west side of the map. Um, most of Moncton falls in the Lewis Creek watershed, but 
some is also in Little Otter Creek. Um, LCA has not done any sampling in Little Otter, so I'm not really going to address that tonight. I mostly just talk about um, the Lewis Creek sampling. Okay, so now zooming into Moncton, we had four sites um, along Pond Brook, which is a major tributary to Lewis Creek that we sampled last year, and we are still sampling those this year. We're kind of in a little, um, we do usually about three years at any particular sort of focus area, if you will. Um, so we wanted to revisit these sites because they hadn't been sampled for, I don't know, maybe close to 10 years. So just kind of see what was, see what was going on there. And we do sampling of three different um, nutri uh, three different things, three different parameters in the stream. Um, the first is phosphorus, the second is nitrogen, and the third is chloride, which comes from like road salt. It can come from other sources as well. Um, I'm showing you some raw numbers here. You don't have to pay much attention to them, but I'm circling sort of the four um, Moncton sites there in the middle in red. Okay, so again, looking at um, the four sites that are on the left side of this graph, so the first four are your Moncton Pond Brook sites. Um, the one that's on the red, red with the slashes is closest to Lewis Creek. And then you're kind of moving upstream from there. So the late blue is at uh, Mountain Road, the first crossing of Mountain Road, I guess. And then we have a tributary that drains into Pond Brook where we sample also on Mountain Road. And then the green one is the Mountain Road site that's way up by Bristol Pond, if that makes sense. So in this graph, we're looking at um, phosphorus data. So again, you know, trying to figure out like how much phosphorus is there in the water? Where, you know, where might it be coming from? Um, the dotted red line that you see towards the bottom of the graph is the standard, the state standard for phosphorus. So that's saying like, we shouldn't have more than this in our waterways. So clearly <laughs> we have more than this in our waterways, but that, you know, that's like across pretty much everywhere we sample, unless it's way up in the headwaters of Lewis Creek up in like Starksboro. They're good stuff here, generally not so good stuff. <laughs> um, the, you don't need to know all the details about all this, but um, the, the median is sort of that line that's in the middle of each of the, each of the boxes. Um, and then the, the little tiny thin bars that go up to the bottom and down to, or sorry, up to the top and down to the bottom, those are like the max and min amounts of phosphorus that we sampled. And this is just for one year worth of data. So you can see like two of the sites really stand out as having like pretty high levels of phosphorus, at, at least at their max. Uh, so this Pond Brook tributary and the, and the one that's down on Silver Street, um, just down the road here. Question? Yeah. Bristol, I'm interested in Bristol Oh yeah. Okay. Pond Brook uh, is high. Yeah. There, Bristol Pond is Relatively low. Relatively low, yeah. Does crystal run into It does, yep. Wouldn't that very well? Yeah, you would think. You would think. Yeah, it's, it, and it certainly, I think it does increase as you go, you know, further, I think generally increases as you go further south. So you're like picking up more along the way. So like closer to Bristol Pond is going to be, have less phosphorus than further down. Okay. Lands, all along, uh, lanes, uh, yeah, and I think that's generally true in like most of our waterways, right? Like the for like whether it's farmland or developed land or whatever, like we're or stream bank erosion or anything, like we're just picking up more as you go further down the watershed. Um okay, so during the earlier part of the season when we didn't have the crazy rains, <laughs> this is, you're now looking at sort of the individual sample days that we sampled. So we do this every two weeks or so. So on the left is April, mid-April 2023. On the right is late July 2023. Um, and you can see that, you know, the those tributaries had sort of lower numbers earlier in the season when we didn't have big crazy rains. And then June 12th, which is approximately in the center, we started to get kind of a spike um, with some, some fairly high numbers when those big rains came in. Um, 
the highest value of phosphorus was measured on July 10th. So over on the right side of the screen, that red dot sort of up at the top, and that was down here at the Silver Street site in Moncton. Um, the Pond Brook East tributary site, so the little yellow X on the screen had a pretty similarly high value on that on that same date. Um, so that generally corresponds to the data that we saw from 2012, which indicated that 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 the site right down here on Silver Street had the highest values of nutrients. Um, and let's see, what else do I need to tell you about that? Um, I think that's about it. So, oh, I should mention on those previous slides, let me go back just for a second, that that red line at the bottom, the state standard, it really only applies when um, flow levels in the stream are quite low. So it's like when there's not, not a lot of flow. We didn't meet those conditions at any sample date last year. So <laughs> these numbers are not directly comparable to that standard. So even though I said there is a lot, which is true, there is a lot, um, I can't claim that they are, you know, that those numbers compared to the state standard are a valid comparison, if you will. Um, maybe this year we won't have as much rain and we'll actually get some samples on days that are quite low flow. Um, okay, so now we're looking at nitrogen. Um, so a different nutrient that also feeds algae growth and, and plant growth. Um, the state standard for nitrogen is also not directly comparable here because it's focused just on one like type of nitrogen called nitrate. Um, and it, that is just one portion of this value that we're measuring. This is called total nitrogen. So the state standard says that nitrate should not exceed five milligrams per liter. Five milligrams per liter is not even on this graph. This is like the maximum up at the very top is three milligrams per liter. So we're not really anywhere near that state standard. We're well below, we're at like 1.5 at the maximum. Um, so even though we're not like directly applicable to the state standard, we don't seem to really be approaching it, it can still kind of help us tease out like where certain nutrients might be coming from in the, in the watershed. Um, the highest values for nitrogen during our sampling last year were actually not here. They were in Kimball and Thorpe Brooks out near um, Lake Champlain, the, those direct to lake drainages. Um, so really none of the Moncton sites stood out as like, you know, having super high or, or extraordinarily high nitrogen values. Okay, so a third graph for you, um, chloride concentrations. Chloride comes from road salt, but it can also come from the solution they spray on dirt roads in the summer to keep the dust down. Water softeners, even agricultural fertilizers can all contribute chloride. Um, when it's dissolved in water, it can wash into water bodies and it can be toxic to aquatic organisms. So our standard here in Vermont um, is Part of it anyways is this red line um, which says that the the chronic level of chloride should not exceed that line as a four-day average in a three-year period um, and essentially again we're not directly comparable to that standard because we're just sampling like occasionally every two weeks as opposed to having like a continuous sample going all the time um, there's some recent research that indicates that our aquatic life may be impacted at chloride levels that are much lower than that red line, like maybe even down to like 50 milligrams per liter. Um, but happily for Moncton, you guys have very low chloride levels. Um, actually, the lowest level that we measured all year was at the Pond Brook East Tributary site, so the one that comes in from across Mountain Road. Um, so that's great. Um, keep it up. <laughs> Hopefully it stays that way. Um, chloride is one of those things that we can't really like remove easily from water. Like once it's polluted with chloride, like it just kind of stays that way. Uh, I heard about, I think it was a Sable Lake over in New York where they had so much road salt impact that the lake actually didn't turn over in the spring because it was just like, like the, the chloride, the salt in the lake just made it so it didn't 
didn't change. Didn't change. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully we don't ever get to that point, but it's kind of a kind of a scary thought. Okay, so just for your knowledge, um, the state, you know, takes these data. We're part of like a state partnership, and they include both the water quality data, but they also do fish and um, bug or macro invertebrate analyses and streams to help determine like how healthy they are and whether they should be deemed impaired or stressed. Um, and that's a designation that DEC makes in conjunction with the US EPA, so sort of uh, as part of the Clean Water Act. Um, so these are fish assessment results in the Lewis Creek watershed. And you can see, I think you can see the one point, it's really light green up at the top, sort of north end of Pondbrook watershed, where fish were showing good results. So not very good, not excellent, but right in the middle, good. Um, and at that same site, our macro invertebrate or bug results were, I believe, a little bit better than that. Good, very good. <laughs> um, so doing okay, you know, doing pretty well, but a little hard to tell since they only did this one sample in month, as far as you guys are concerned. Okay, so I'm going to transition now away from like results into sort of what landowners and towns and whatnot can do to help, you know, improve water quality, <clears throat> whether that's at their homes or uh, town, you know, town regulations, that kind of thing. Um, so we have a program called the Head of the Storm, which demonstrates um, some of these principles that we just learned about slowing the water down, sinking it into the ground and spreading it out. So the three S's. And um, we have demonstration sites throughout mostly the La Platte watershed that, um, that show off these sort of optimal practices and try to encourage landowners to, to improve those things on their own land. And so I just wanna do a couple examples of what that might look like. Um, this is an example of slowing the water down um, up at the top side of the screen. You've got Thorpe Brook, you can't really see it, but it is there, I promise. Um, this is like a roadside ditch that goes down to Thorpe Brook. And so we installed these check dams, rock check dams um, with sort of settling basins on the uphill side of them. So that as the water goes down this ditch or swale down towards the brook, it slows down, it can drop its sediment. Um, those plants can take up, take up the sediment and the nutrients. Uh, this is the Heinsberg Town Garage. So originally the buildings at the Town Garage uh, were, you know, fairly close to this stream to Beecher Brook. And there was like a berm or a, you know, a mound of, of dirt next to the brook. And so we were able to remove the mound of dirt, build a new building, uh, you know, remove the old buildings and make space for that stream to really spread out onto a newly created floodplain. So what would have been there naturally and originally. Um, there are new rocks and logs sort of embedded in the stream to help like raise the level of the stream bed to allow it to, to flood out onto its floodplain and drop that sediment out of the water. Uh, this is a site at Shelburne Community School where originally this was just like a grassy lawn area where the school buses dropped like the school bus circle. Uh, there were some storm grates in the ground, you know, all the road salt and <clears throat> whatever was coming off the buses was going straight into the storm grates and then pumped right out into the brook. Like there was no, there's no treatment or whatever. So we were able to build this rain garden. <clears throat> now the water flows into that rain garden, sinks into the ground, gets taken up by plants uh, before being sent on to the brook and into Lake Champlain. Okay, so towns, um, you know, just a few, I guess, suggestions for town. I know we have a few town, I don't know, commissioners here. Um, enhancing that language for protection of river corridors, you know, buffers, floodplains, wetlands, all those things in your town plans and land use regulations um, can help improve, you know, increase our distances from rivers and that kind of thing and, and help improve that. Um, both water quality and for human, you know, damages and that kind of thing. Um, going above and beyond are some of our existing state regulations and sort of designing for these bigger storms that we're seeing with climate change and that kind of thing. Um, for example, like you could lower the trigger for the review of um, the amount of impervious surface. So in Heinsberg, we have 
enhanced stormwater management practices that require, um, you know, if you're developing more than 10,000 square feet, you have to have like a stormwater plan in place as opposed to the state's one acre trigger. So I was just kind of saying, hey, we want you to do stormwater even though you're you know, doing something smaller than what the state um, requires. <clears throat> We talked about this already, upgrading our roads for larger storms. Um, the town roads are required to do this municipal roads general permit to make these bigger swales, um, to you know, make sure they're not dumping sediment into the, into the streams. This particular roadside swale is part of that photo I showed you earlier with the check dams, um, but that was designed to carry water from a 100 year storm. So just more volume, you know, more, more water that can be carried downstream there. Um, and of course, the, the town permit that I mentioned, it really only applies to town roads. So we have lots of driveways and private roads. Um, we can make sure that our new, new private roads are designed well using those same principles. Um, you guys are lucky here. You only have 12% of your roads that are private. Uh, some of them are some towns that we serve are really high, like Shelburne, I think it's 43% of their roads are private roads. So. <laughs> um, so in some ways, you're lucky. I guess in some ways, maybe you're paying more taxes because your town has to do the municipal roads general permit on all your town roads. Um, but, you know, this includes things like crowning the road properly, you know, designing, digging out those swales so they're nice and like shallow and wide, not just like a, a narrow V, making sure we have those grass line ditches or, or check dams going down into streams um, and just sort of generally slowing the flow of that water before it, before it reaches our waterways. Um, the data that I showed you tonight will soon be available in this format on our website. So we have sort of this map format where you can see different colored dots and size dots for the different locations that we've sampled over the years. Um, this will be the third year of data that we have up on the website. So hopefully, I'm thinking maybe in the next two weeks, fingers crossed, um, you can go to our website and find this map. Um, of course, protecting natural areas of high public value. You guys do an awesome job of that here in Moncton with your ANAC committee and everything. And you guys have a lot of great conservation projects going. Um, and then, of course, trying to mitigate the impacts from our, our <laughs> past, I guess, mistakes, if you will, from building and farming too close to our stream corridors and our wetlands. Um, this is, I guess, sort of a rough example of that. And I wish I knew where that one was too, but. <clears throat> okay, so now what can you do on your own property? Um, gonna try to go through this fairly quickly, but you know, you wanna keep the soil on your property. You don't wanna let it erode. So whether that's redirecting your downspout so you're not getting like erosion off your downspouts or using a rain barrel, um, fixing these type of gullies, be, you know, when they've just begun before they become huge problems crowning your driveway, allowing that water to shoot, to sort of flow off to the side as opposed to like running down the, the tracks where you drive. Allowing water to soak into the soil, you know, creating a little rain garden of sorts where you can, you know, plants can slow that water down and, and sink it in. Using natives, um, cutting your grass, you know, shorter than three inches can help slow water down. Um, those taller grass and plants can really, you know, have deeper root systems that can catch more water than short grass does. And then, of course, maintaining your trees and shrubs along your waterways. Um, and that includes not just streams, but, you know, ditches and, and all that sort of thing as well um, can help minimize those pollutants and sediments that are reaching, reaching our waters. Um, a few other things, I won't even read them because you guys can all read. And then we get to get into the new material, which I'm excited about. Um, we have the, I just mentioned these two things. These are both like statewide um, programs that are initiated by other organizations. We don't actually do either lake-wise or stream-wise um, assessments and awards, but they are programs that are available um, you can have someone come out to your property. Like if you live on the lake or on the pond, you can have someone come out and assess your property and say, 
hey, you're doing a great job with this. Like, it would be really good if you put in a buffer over here or you planted a few more shrubs or we did this uh, rain garden over here. Um, similarly with Streamwise, they'll come out and look if you have a stream in for your property, kind of give you an assessment of like ideas that, that of things that you could do on your property to help. Um, so the new manual that I'm going to pass around here for you guys to take a peek at, there's one in your library as well, I think, oh. Um, <laughs> If you have questions about, you know, how to assess your land or like try to figure out what needs to be done or what could be done just voluntarily, um, we have this new manual out to kind of guide you through that process um, of looking at the, you know, looking at your property, looking at the land. I'm going to show you just a few pages out of the manual so you can get sort of a feel for, for what it looks like. Um, so we talked a little bit about stormwater management, which you guys are all experts in now because you know about the three S's, sort of the slow it, spread it, sink it. Um, we talked about how to assess your site and then a series of activities that will help you sort of determine the best practice for that area or that like problem or that, to identify that. Um, and then we take you to other resources because there are a lot of resources out there. A lot of booklets have been produced on stormwater management and rain garden building and you know you name it. Um, so our, our goal here was just to kind of help get you to those, to those other places because other people have described well how to build the rain garden, for example. Um, so we talk about like how to assess a site, you know, how to draw a map and like figure out where the water is flowing. We talk about possible solutions, like if you have a problem with, I don't know, the water coming off your roof, like answer a series of questions. Do you have gutters? Yes or no? Um, you know, is, you know, should you just direct the water into a, into a planted area or are there some better steps you could take? Like if you're talking about a rain garden, we have a little activity to walk you through figuring out how much water gets to that area. So like how big your rain garden needs to be. That's that activity I was just talking about. Looks a little crazy, but it's not that hard. It's kind of fun to walk through and try to like use your measuring tape and figure out how much you know, how much land, how much water coming off the land is getting to a certain point on your property. Um, we talk about figuring out like how, what, you know, what type of soils you have. Like if you want to put in a rain garden, you don't want to put in a rain garden and then just have the water sit there for a week because it doesn't soak into the ground because you have the wrong kind of soils. So how do you figure out, you know, what, um, what type of soils do you have? Is this a good area to put a rain garden in or should we be looking at some other ideas? And then, as I mentioned, um, a bunch of other resources, links, and, you know, I guess in this case, it's not links, but um, you, you can find any of these things that are available um, available online to, to help you take the next steps. Um, this is also available on our website. If you prefer the paper version in your library, cool, but we also have it online, so you can click through it there. Um, and you know, thanks to Moncton, you guys provide some funding support to us every year in the form of your town budget. And of course, we have volunteers who help collect data for our for our water quality sampling team. So if anyone's interested in joining us, we're always happy to have new folks. And you know, just in closing, I guess I would say that our you know investing our time and our money now in these sort of preventive measures and taking taking those steps. Um, as well as fixing our past mistakes will really cost us less in the end than trying to wait until it gets worse and worse. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, you talked about past mistakes. Well, what about people with mercury? Mm -hmm. Mercury. Like yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah, so we used to test for E. coli for bacteria. Um, and we haven't done that recently. Um, the state kind of stopped paying for the samples. Um, so in general, e, e. coli or bacteria in Lewis Creek is not great. Um, it's actually impaired for bacteria in a, in a stretch of Lewis Creek. Um, in general, I would say it's mostly high after storm events. So don't go swimming in the creek if it's up and muddy. <laughs> it's a general good policy anyways, I guess. Um, <clears throat> things like mercury, um, 
I know that Shelburne Bay is impaired for mercury. Like the, you don't want to go eat fish out of Shelburne Bay. Um, we don't test for it. I'm not even sure if there is an easy test. Like I'm sure there is, but it's not something that we've investigated like in our in our river systems. So I can't tell you a whole lot about that, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that you identify in trees and fish. Yeah, uh, a, does it affect them somehow? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the sediment certainly does, right? Like just having more soil and whatnot in our streams is going to cover up all those little like spaces under the rocks that the bugs need and that the fish need to eat the bugs and to lay their eggs and all that stuff. Um, I would assume, I mean, obviously at the like at the extreme end of it, once you get those algae blooms and whatnot, that can kill both fish and frogs and, and all that stuff. Um, but I think that, you know, just the impacts of those nutrients and the sediment and whatnot on, you know, on the bugs and the fish, um, even at those lower levels could be could be damaging. But I don't have a lot of information. Like I don't have data that I can cite for you. <laughs> Is, yeah. is there funding to help with some of these for private? I mean, I know yeah. the, the municipal government gets some assistance here and there. Right. Private. Yeah. So there's um, there's no funding directly to private individuals that I'm aware of. Um, there are there is funding now through the Clean Water Fund for um, both towns and nonprofits and some others like schools and whatnot can apply for funding to do a voluntary clean water project that will reduce phosphorus. Um, there are, as we're finding, this is a fairly new program. So it's like maybe we're maybe a year into it, year, year and a half. Um, we're finding that it can be hard to get the right type of project that they want to fund because they want to fund the projects that reduce a lot of phosphorus and are not very expensive. And so the, the cost effectiveness value um, is really a challenge sometimes. So, you know, you might have a great rain garden project that you want to put in, but boy, it's going to cost you $400,000 and you're only reducing, you know, whatever, I don't know, just throw a number one kilogram of phosphorus per year out there. Um, and they're going to look at that and go, no way, you know, <laughs> way too expensive. Um, it seems like some of the other projects that are more, cost effective are things like reconnecting floodplains. Like if you can, you know, remove a little berm and allow the water to reconnect to the floodplain along the stream, that's usually a pretty cost effective project. Um, tree planting's pretty good too, usually. Um, so any of those types of projects, you know, I, I would love to hear about, like if you guys have here in Moncton, like if you're aware of, areas where folks might be interested in doing some kind of project. Like we're always open to those, to hearing those ideas. And we have somewhat limited capacity. I'm right now I'm the only staff person. So, and I'm part-time. So it means that I'm, I can only manage so many projects at a time, but um, it's always good to like, you know, have that sort of running, that idea, that running list, whatever. Um, and start thinking about like, where could that project fit in, in the various sort of funding sources. So. So last time that Moncton Pond was tested, I know you guys at one point did a really mm. thorough test of all the invasive species. Oh, the invasives, yeah. I know it's so different than this. Yeah. Did you know? Yeah, so, yeah, we did in 2020, I think was the year. Um, I think that's true. That was yeah, COVID. Yeah. It was somewhere in there. Um, and, and that's the last time that we've, we've done that, but we did like the, you know, sampling every, I forget what it was, a hundred meters. How did meters. you go about doing that as an association, like association? Yeah. Um, that is a great question. I think you can probably ask, I would probably start with the DEC staff who might have either resources or like no um, the best like protocol to do it. Um, I would talk to Kim Jensen oh, at the state. Yeah. You're already on. Yeah, you're with her. Um, so, I mean, I know they come out and do some assessments sometimes, but I don't think it's quite the same. Like, yeah, 
Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Some of the projects you've already been involved with are they open to the public or somebody can kind of see those? I, mean, I think I just yeah. saw one near the library in Charlotte. Yep. Yeah, any of those are open to the public, the head of the storm sites. There's material on our website if you really want to dive into like what happened there. And if there's a little too much material on our website, if you ask me, but <laughs> well, <laughs> one of these days I'm going to pare it down a little better. Um, but there's a nice little, there's a little story map if you want to like cruise around and just look at the different points for these ahead of the storm demonstration sites and see what they all are and, you know, what they did. Um, that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think that helps a lot of people to see an actual example of something. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if it's somebody's, you know, five acres and they did this and that and yeah. fixed the drainage along their driveway or, you know, buffer got reforested or whatever. Yeah. re -registated. Yeah. It helps. Yeah, so that is a good idea to take a little tour. Maybe we'll do another tour one of these days. Yeah, the big rain garden there on Silver Street. Yeah, the right. corner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good one. It treats a lot of our Heinsberg stormwater essentially coming off the town roads and whatnot. Um, we're putting in a new we do a wetland restoration this year in Heinsburg behind the United Church. So as you're going north on the west side, um, looking forward to that being completed. It was supposed to be completed last year and flooding yeah. got in our way. It's it's like like work no, no, it's not. So hopefully, this year. well, it better be done this year. Funding runs out this year, so it will be completed. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Really appreciate thank you for it. Thanks for coming. I'm happy to take more questions too. Cookies, yeah.